probably useful to have a bit of a brief chat about the kinds of language that will be used throughout this presentation today. So in the presentation, we'll be using the LGBT plus acronym, but as we can see on the slide here, this can include a multitude of identities. So probably the most recognizable are the LGBT, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans. And in the acronym on the slide, we can also see the inclusion of the Q for queer or questioning people, the I for intersex people, and the A for asexual or aromantic people and the plus which kind of recognizes that there are a real multitude of dynamic and changing language that people use to better describe um, their sexual orientation, their romantic identity or their gender identity and in the projects I'm going to be talking about we've been really kind of very explicitly open that we want to include anyone who feels that they belong under the kind of rainbow LGBT plus umbrella and so we were deliberately really non-prescriptive in that so I hope that makes that clear. Um, so first project that I'm going to be talking about, and this is the project that most of the presentation will focus on, is um, called Understanding LGBT Plus Youth Suicide in Scotland. Um, this I completed last year at the University of Glasgow. It was my doctoral research, which I did alongside Professor Lisa McDade, Professor Rory O'Connor and Professor Rich Mitchell. Um, and this was a qualitative project. So we did in-depth interviews, which focused really on exploring young LGBT plus people's understandings of their own experience experiences of suicidal distress in Scotland. So we recruited 24 LGBT plus young people. They were aged 16 to 24 with an average age of 19.6. And they came from all across Scotland. So all the way from the Scottish borders up to the Scottish Highlands and many, many stops in between. Um, there was a real kind of spread of sexual or romantic orientations within the sample. Um, many of those were kind of non-monosexual, so bisexual, pansexual, queer people. Um, there was also a real balance of gender identities, as you'll see on the slide. Um, and although we didn't recruit for it, there was a really high number of young people that participated in this study um, who had a disability, a health condition or a learning difficulty. The majority of young people were still within the education system, whether that was school, college or university, um, but some of them were working whether full time or part time. Um, and within this sample, all the young people had experienced suicidal thoughts. Um, and of, the, of those young people, 10 had made a suicide attempt. And of those young people who had made a suicide attempt, all 10 of them had made that attempt more than once. Um, Together, we discussed how suicide had affected their life and in particular, how they made sense of their own experiences of suicidal distress. We also spoke about what contributed to feeling suicidal and what made those suicidal feelings worse, um, as well as what had helped them to stay alive and helped them to recover from suicidal distress. And to close the interviews, we talked about what they believed would reduce LGBT plus youth suicide in Scotland in the future. And those kinds of questions are gonna be what stretches this presentation today. The second project though that I'm going to touch upon much more briefly because we're kind of right at the start of it currently um, is the Suicide in As Politics project which is funded by Leverhulme um, um, and in this project I'm working um, at the University of Edinburgh um, in partnership with the University of Lincoln with colleagues Dr Amy Chandler, Dr Anna Jordan and Dr Alex Oten um, and we're currently undertaking an analysis of political discussions and representations of suicide between the years 2009 and 19. And in this, we're looking at a sample of eight suicide prevention policies um, that were enacted um, during this time period. So two from each from England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, as well as looking for every reference made to suicide between these dates in the records of the four parliaments and assemblies. And within this data set, I have then kind of drilled down and identified all of the references made to suicide that were also made in relation to LGBT plus people. And I'm currently kind of undertaking that analysis. So you'll see a few brief flashes of data from that project throughout this, but it's really early stages. But I wanted to share some of that data with you today. And for me, I think considering LGBT plus suicide as a political issue, in addition to a clinical one, is really, really important. And this is why. So here we have a timeline I've created of LGBT plus suicide history in the UK. And I think that whenever we're working on this topic, it's incredibly important to acknowledge how the socio-political, legislative and medical, including psychological structures of our society have played a really active role in contributing to LGBT plus 
suicide through enacting stigma. And I think it's, this is particularly important when we think about how we try and encourage um, LGBT plus young people to try and seek help. Um, because I think sometimes this type of history of mistrust can really infuse how young people experience trying to access services today. And so I think it, it's really important for us um, as practitioners to keep that in mind. Okay, so let's get going. Globally, suicide is the fourth leading cause of death amongst young people aged 15 to 29. And here where I work in Scotland in 2019, suicide was the leading cause of death amongst young people aged five to 19, and the second leading cause of death amongst those aged 20 to 34. And within this young population, LGBT plus young people are estimated to be somewhere between three and four times more likely to think about and attempt suicide globally. However, here in the UK, our evidence about this disparity is patchy. And this is potentially because there's been a reluctance to ask young people about their sexual orientation or romantic orientation, their trans identity, and their experiences of suicidal thoughts and attempts. And as a result, when we bring these topics together, we simply don't know much about them. And this is particularly the case in Scotland, as the majority of research that has happened already has focused on those young people living in England and Wales. And for that reason, this project focused solely on those young people living in Scotland. Now, whilst this absence of data may seem unfortunate, but perhaps inconsequential given the global data that we have, we see here in this quote from Preventing Suicide in England from 2012, the Suicide Prevention Policy, that this lack of data can mean that it is difficult to prioritise this group for more specialised or tailored suicide prevention efforts due to the lack of data helping us to understand the scope and the nature of this problem in this population, resulting in us being unable to evaluate the effectiveness of any potential interventions that we might wish to implement. And so this lack of data, whilst it might seem inconsequential, actually can have some incredibly problematic consequences. Globally, however, we do have some idea about why LGBT plus young people are more likely to think about and attempt suicide. So in the 1990s, Mayer constructed the minority stress theory to explain why gay men appeared to experience worse physical and mental health outcomes when compared to heterosexual men. But this theory has subsequently been developed to include all LGBT plus people. And Mayer argued that in addition to the everyday stresses that everyone experiences, such as, you know, how to pay your bills, do well at school or work and get along with your loved ones, LGBT plus people experienced additional stresses that are chronic, social and specific to being LGBT plus, such as experiencing or expecting stigma discrimination or harassment, targeting one's LGBT plus identity, concealing your own LGBT plus identity to avoid stigma experiences, and internalising homophobia, biphobia or transphobia, which taken together we'll talk about as queerphobia to encapsulate all types of discrimination against all kinds of LGBT plus people, unless specifically stated. Um, however, Although this kind of connection between stigma, discrimination and harassment and suicidal distress has a real intuitive appeal, LGBT plus youth suicide research has been criticised for over-focusing on those factors considered LGBT plus specific in a way that reduces young people to be considered only as their LGBT plus identity and does not take into account any additional challenging experiences that may not relate to their sexuality, their romantic identity or their gender. So in my study, I was interested to see how participants thought about the balance of factors that both were and were not related to LGBT plus identity as contributors to suicidal distress. So here we have an overview of the contributory factors that participants considered pertinent. And as we see here on the slide, there are a range of factors, some of which were either LGBT plus specific or were heavily influenced by queer phobias. So things like coming out, bullying and social isolation and community climate. However, there are also some factors that we would perhaps expect to see more broadly amongst all young people experiencing suicidal distress, so things like abuse and educational challenges, which are often forgotten about when we talk about LGBT plus young people because of this tendency to focus in on those factors deemed more LGBT plus specific. 
Now, I'm going to use some quotes in this presentation, but I am going to ask you, please don't photograph them to share on social media. As whilst I have permission to share them, I fear it could be quite confronting for a young person to see them from a stranger during some casual kind of lunchtime scrolling to see those, their own words projected back to them by a stranger. However, this said, I must reassure you that all the quotes have been anonymised and pseudonyms have been applied for all participants. Okay, so the community climate in which participants lived um, was considered a subtle yet enormously important contributor to suicidal distress. And this kind of community climate spanned hate incidents, online transphobia that was witnessed not necessarily directly towards the participants, but just kinds of articles or other people kind of commenting that they then bore witness to. And more subtle everyday comments, questions and looks that participants experienced. So in this quote from Yasmin, we see her describing how the expected non-acceptance of LGBT plus people made it harder for her to feel like she was able to move through the world. And for participants in this study, these everyday kinds of acts continually established and re-established being cisgender, so not trans, and heterosexual as both normal and desirable. And what is interesting is that the comments like, when you have a husband or girls bring your guys and guys bring your girls at a work event, were quoted by participants perhaps feel so benign to us as researchers or practitioners um, that they therefore are considered too distant to have an impact on suicidal distress. But it was exactly these kinds of comments that established the climate in which participants felt unable to come out or which on coming out they expected it to be bullied, rejected and isolated and often were. And so here in the quote from Andrew, we see some of the consequences of this type of community climate in which Andrew portrays homophobic bullying at school as a very normal, routine and expected part of his experiences as a non-binary gay young person. And this was really common across participants in this study, which could also be further compounded where there were also experiences of ableist, classist or more generalised bullying. However, as stated by Andrew here, these bullying experiences could be extremely isolating and are known as a contributor to suicidal distress amongst young people more broadly. Responding to this isolation, Andrew instead made friends online using online gaming sites to reduce this sense of isolation. But it was unfortunate that it was there that he became a victim of online grooming. And other participants discuss the ways in which bullying had long term kind of chronic impacts on their sense of self esteem and self confidence and self compassion. And for some, this was due to an internalization of the bully's criticism. So one young person talked about being told that no one would ever love her, whilst another one talked about um, people in his class comparing him to a 40 year old virgin and, and saying that he would never be able to have sex. And this had a real chronic impact on the ways in which these young people were able to continue to have friendships and relationships long, long after the kind of acute incidents of bullying had happened and when they'd well moved away from school. So they had a really long term impact. And I also think it's really important that we, we don't think about bullying as something, therefore, that's limited to children in schools. And I found this quote in our new data set, which I think really illustrates the point. So this is a Mr O'Dowd from the Northern Irish Assembly in 2012, um, who says that the attitudes in our schools are often a reflection of the attitudes in our broader society. And I think this is so important to remember because bullying, I think, is, is often seen as something contained within schools. Um, and whilst it may be highly visible in the school environment, Environment, it's definitely not limited to educational environments. Moving on, many young people in the study had experienced physical, emotional or sexual abuse. And as we well know, the experiences of childhood adversities um, can have a long impact, a long reaching impact on suicidal distress. So Yasmin here discusses the ways in which she internalised the abuse from her stepfather, beginning to believe that she wasn't ever meant to be happy and in turn making her feel home hopeless. And I think it's really important that we consider how these factors can interact with one another. So, for example, um, bullying that was happening within the school environment um, often meant that young people whose parents had difficulties with their coming out um, felt that school was a place in which they had a great need to achieve in order to do well and move away for university which for the majority of participants in this study was the only gateway they envisaged to leaving home and living independently. And therefore schools were for many a really high pressured environment. 
For two participants in this study, a problem experience with an educational assessment was exactly what acted as a catalyst for a suicide attempt. But what's really important to remember here was that that, that kind of problem was really the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, in both the instances, a young person found out about this assessment problem online, and this meant that they were alone when they found out. And in addition to everything else that was going on in their life, it very quickly spiralled and became a suicide attempt. So it's a really important learning point, I think, for when we're trying to communicate with young people. The young people in this study coming out could be a real pressure point as well. And although this was particularly the case for religious young people, so for example, Ailey here, who proactively sought out options for at-home conversion therapy to try and change her sexual orientation, um, it was also the case for young people who didn't have a specific faith. And often this was due to the community climate in which they lived and the anticipated or actual reactions that they had from those around them. So on coming out, many young people were met by non-accepting attitudes, often primarily from families, but for some participants also from friends. And as a result, some young people chose to come out at a distance using videos or letters to their families. And for others, they had not been able to come out yet and simply led what was described by one young person as a double life. For those young people who had come out to their families, they found that at least for a short period of time, often they could end up living in what was termed, um, or has been termed by McDermott and Rowan as a constrained space in which young people attempt to navigate being authentically themselves in a way that could also be accepted or at least tolerated by their families. And that could be incredibly difficult for those young people. This is perhaps most starkly demonstrating demonstrated in this comment from Ewan in which he describes for him a sense of what he termed do or die. So he stated that he felt he would eventually either find a way to come out or die by suicide. But for Ewan coming out really represented an enormous barrier to him as he was incredibly concerned about the stigma that he would face from those around him and the loss of standing and respect that he would have in his local community and networks. But he also articulates something really important here about his own understanding of suicidal distress, which he articulates as not real and not serious. And we're just going to talk about this for a moment. So all participants in this study have begun to think about suicide age 14 or younger. But for many, these early suicidal thoughts were classified using terms which diminished their significance due to an early lack of intention to act upon them. However, despite this, the majority of participants went on to have further suicidal thoughts, which they either had experienced an intention to act on or had indeed acted upon. Therefore, despite participants diminishing the importance of these early suicidal thoughts, they perhaps offer an opportunity for us as clinicians and researchers for early intervention. Participants also articulated their own understanding of suicide attempts, and in particular, the boundaries between self-harm and suicide attempts. For some participants, self-harm was seen as a tool which they used to downregulate their own emotional distress, although two participants described their reluctance to say that this had worked due to their desire for other coping mechanisms that they felt were healthier. And for some, these concepts of kind of healthiness were really reflective of the attitudes that young people heard from those around them. Um, but that could have a real impact on how they understood receiving mental health care in relation to self-harm. So for one young person, a more kind of harm reduction approach that didn't insist that they see self-harming was appropriate. Whilst for another, this could be seen as the practitioner not taking their self-harm seriously if they were not told to stop immediately. And I I think this really highlights for me the highly personalised needs of young people self-harming and the need to get to know them in order to be able to be useful to their recovery. On the other hand, some participants described how although at some time self-harm was a way of self-soothing and calming down, if the expected relief was not found, they had experienced an escalating severity of self-harm, which in turn could become part of the suicide attempt. In this quote, we see Ayla talking about a sense of blurriness between self-harm and suicide attempts. And for Ayla and for another participant called Harley, there was a level of blurriness articulated about whether or not they had the desire to enact self-harm with or without suicidal intention before, during and after an incident. Therefore, although a barrier can and often is drawn between self-harm and suicide, positioning self-harm as distinct from, although linked to suicide, there was a sense from participants in this study that at times there was far more blur between these somewhat neat categorizations. <laughs> 
Now, participants made sense of suicide in many varied and overlapping ways. So for some, despite many years of suicidal thoughts, at the time at which they attempted suicide, participants could experience that moment of a suicide attempt as a surprise or a loss of control. And in describing this, there was a real distinction made between the individual's mind losing control over what was sort of portrayed as an unruly body. Um, and often this was almost a description of disassociation. This kind of narrative of the mind keeping and then losing control over suicidal thoughts through the embodiment of a suicide attempt is that almost in contrast to the conceptualization that other participants offered um, as suicide as brave or as strong, which really seemed to downplay the efforts that it had taken for those participants to stay alive on a day to day basis. For others, suicide was conceptualised as a way of escaping from a situation to which the participant felt there was no available resolution. So Lily here acts as one example of a range of instances of what we have termed queer entrapment that were found throughout the participants' narrative. So Lily described how her parents found themselves unable to accept her sexual orientation, in particular because of their religious beliefs, but other participants reported that their parents have similarly found themselves unable to accept their LGBT plus identity without religious motivation. And so for Lily, her father really felt that she was destroying the family when she came out um, as a lesbian and really found that very, very difficult. Participants described parental non-acceptance of LGBT plus identity as presented to them as unable to be changed, even if it later was, and often it later was. And whilst parents were presumed to be expressing a rejection of their child's LGBT plus identity in a manner that suggested they thought it was possible to separate this from their child as a person as a whole, for participants, their gender identity, sexual orientation or romantic identity was often seen as such a fundamental part of the sense of self that a rejection of it was understood as a rejection of them as the whole person. Within this context, some participants conceptualise suicide as a broader kind of existential questioning, extending and internalising the rejection that they faced externally and embodying it through the suicide attempt. And in this manner, feeling suicidal wasn't really situated as kind of internal to the participants or externally to the queer phobia that they faced um, but instead it was kind of situated in the spaces created in those interactions between participants their close networks and broader society further to this some participants described the communicative role that the suicidal distress could play so the majority of participants in this study had reached out for professional help primarily through their general practitioners but many hadn't received the support that they had desired. For some, therefore, suicide attempts or the disclosure of suicidal thoughts or self-harm could be positioned as demonstrating the severity of their distress and a need for support. Um, this isn't to suggest that this was the only reason that participants had attempted suicide, but just to point towards the ways in which the scarcity of services for young people experiencing suicidal distress often shaped the ways in which it was possible to disclose that distress, have it taken seriously and access support. So kind of following on from this, many studies have described young people as reluctant to seek out support from professionals and as preferring to access support more from peers. But in this study, the majority of participants um, described themselves as being really proactive about help seeking, although many had faced barriers to accessing that support. And it's those barriers we're just going to briefly talk about. So one challenge faced within this specific population was the balance between specialist mental health care and gender affirming health care. So some participants reported that neither service, mental health service or gender affirming health care, felt sufficiently specialised to provide care for trans young people experiencing suicidal distress. And so young people could end up kind of trapped between services without sufficient support. Um, so it appeared that perhaps there was a need for clearer guidance on how to manage the care of trans young people experiencing suicidal distress. A further barrier was the lack of mental health services available both for cis and trans young people. Um, so this lack of services meant that they were often waiting on really long waiting lists. And one of the challenges of this, of course, is that um, waiting a really long time, young people's expectations could often increase and they were really hopeful for the services that they were going to access at the end of the waiting list. And therefore, this could have a huge negative impact um, if the service didn't quite live up to those expectations. It could be a really enormous disappointment. Other participants' concerns 
but being a burden on their friends and family was a concern, which of course is widely acknowledged as a real difficulty with young people experiencing suicidal distress. And this was reinforced where parents themselves had negative attitudes towards help seeking, either diminishing the severity of young people's suicidal distress or expressing a reluctance about seeking help with them. Um, and often this was sort of described by participants as due to a perception from parents that a young person's mental health problems were in some way due to something lacking in that kind of parental provision that they were able to make. Finally, some young people describe being told that their suicidal distress was part and parcel of being a teenager, kind of drawing on those narratives about hormones, and that it would pass. What seemed less clear, however, was what to do if it didn't pass. And this was particularly the case where young people didn't want to share the severity of their distress during an initial disclosure, perhaps with a GP. Now, I know that probably sounds a lot of kind of doom and gloom, but there were things that helped. So professional support, where the therapeutic alliance between participant and practitioner worked, had the potential to be hugely positively impactful. Unfortunately, due to the time limitations on things like CBT, some participants reported limited, to, uh, limited positive impact, with sessions helping whilst they were happening, but not necessarily having a sustained positive impact after contact was ceased. Further to this, in times of crisis, immediately accessible support was prioritised, and so this was often provided through third sector organisations, kind of helplines and chat lines, or by friends, often other LGBT plus young people. And the key part of this that was prioritised by young people was getting distraction during those times of crisis. So this didn't necessarily need to be focused on or talking about suicidal thoughts, but it needed to be sufficiently distracting so as to disrupt the suicidal thoughts. However, there was a recognition that when supported by peers, there were challenges because peers often didn't have the skills or the support themselves to provide this kind of help. Participants also found the connection to other LGBT plus people, whether online through social media or offline through university societies, youth groups, or kind of just chance meetings. It's incredibly beneficial for reducing isolation and gaining a sense of collective identity and belonging. Um, and if this wasn't available, there was one young person in the study that actually talks about going to the library just to look for books so that she could see herself somewhere, which I thought was really interesting the interview we asked participants what they believe would help reduce LGBT plus youth suicide in the future and participants felt that firstly challenging queerphobic stigma in wider society would help to tackle the contributors to suicidal distress at their roots so this could be either through popular cultural representations of LGBT plus people in films books or on the tv but mainly through the curriculum so Many of the young people in, in this study really, really focused on that on that school environment, perhaps because it had such negative um, experiences within it. However, as some young people had experienced really misplaced efforts to include LGBT plus people in the curriculum, they were careful to articulate the need for teacher training to help support teachers to gently challenge expressions of queer phobia if they came up when LGBT plus people were mentioned in the classroom. And in Scotland, um, this is beginning to be addressed through the introduction of the LGBTI inclusive education. So there's a real opportunity to see how this policy change may impact amongst LGBT plus young people on their mental health and their suicidal distress. Participants were also extremely aware of the resourcing limitations within mental health services and felt that this was an urgent matter that needed attention. Um, within those services, they were keen that practitioners had a strong level of LGBT plus awareness um, and that if this wasn't possible, because they were aware that that's a resource implication, that there was a willingness to be honest about those limitations and to signpost to services that were LGBT plus informed, so to be able to pass them on. In part, I think this was perhaps about an exercise of communication because given the participants' experiences in society more widely, they often expected to be met with queer phobia. And so for them, um, this could be kind of equating their LGBT plus identity with a mental health problem, or it could be failing to use the correct name and pronouns for the young person. And therefore, unless um, services work to explicitly communicate that this would not be the case within their service, it was hard for a young person not to anticipate it. In addition to this, some young people suggested that as they were supported by their friends anyway, that greater support, both in terms of upskilling other young people to support their peers, um, but also care for those young people, providing peer to support to prevent burnout would really help to reduce LGBT plus youth suicide in the future. <laughs>
Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I know it was a super whistle stop tour and I've just tried to give you a flavour of everything. So if you're interested, um, I'm really happy to take questions now, but I know sometimes it's quite daunting on these kinds of Zoom calls to do so. And um, so if you would like to ask a question, but you don't feel confident to do it in this format, please send me an email or um, contact me on Twitter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hazel. Uh, a really fascinating um, presentation there. And please, could I invite anyone who would like to ask uh, Hazel a question? You can just pop it into the Q&A function at the bottom of uh, your Zoom screen uh, there. Uh, Hazel, I'm, I'm really fascinated by all of what, what you said there. I'm wondering, um, it, it struck me, you mentioned religion a little bit. I'm just wondering, what about um, ethnic and, and racial identity? I'm just thinking that some of the, uh, you get a kind of layered uh, stigma for, for, for people where they're confronting a societal stigma, not just for their sexual orientation, but maybe also for their um, uh, ethnicity. And did you have see anything in relation to that? Well, obviously it was quite a small study. So we only had three participants in the study um, that talked about um, kind of a BAME um, mm -hmm. background within it. So it was quite difficult to say. Um, however, kind of within those three participants, I'm just, I'm trying to think about the kinds of experiences that they had had and I, I knew something kind of going into this that I was slightly concerned about was the fact that obviously those intersectional experiences of discrimination and harassment can be can be really difficult and can also be reflected within the LGBT plus community ourselves mm -hmm. um, and I, I, what I thought was really interesting is that um, those young people had kind of found communities in which they did feel comfortable um, and sometimes they work specifically AME LGBT plus communities which have been quite helpful um, and I think one of the really interesting things within that is kind of the role of the internet in in finding those kinds of communities and being able to access them yeah yeah thank you no that's 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 very interesting and as you say of course in a in a in, in a small study it's 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 hard yeah. to know i'm just interested in in the extent uh to to, to which uh, that was an issue are you i mean are there um further developments from this i mean are you or is was this your phd and you're moving on now to looking at the the other, uh, the, the research on, on um, policy documents? So, um, so one of the things, so, so this was my, my doctoral research um, and it is something that I'm really keen kind of, I'm putting together fellowship applications uh, in the hope that I will be able to, to continue this. And in particular, I'm quite interested in how, how these kinds of experiences in youth maybe impact people in later life, in what interventions can we design to help to support those young people and also in looking at what the impact might be on younger young people, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, so I'm very interested in putting this forward. I am currently obviously working on the suicide in as politics, but the next step on will hopefully be some follow on work from this. Great, thanks. And, and and Hazel, sorry, this is going back to one of the very first slides. Yeah, no worries. That's totally fine. Um, now, I don't know, and I, I hope I'm remembering this correctly, but it looked to me, um, so you flashed up um, a screen with, um, I think, were they mentions of suicide in relation to um, sexuality or sexual orientation in the different parliaments of the... And, was I right in thinking that Northern Ireland was disproportionately represented there? So there was, so there was, I think, one from Scotland and one from Northern Ireland. Yeah, one no, of the quotes. There was a large. There were. There was a number. I, I assumed it was references within um, recordings of of parliamentary processes. Apologies now if I'm sending you back. I, I was just interested. So it's in the, it, was it the parliamentary records? How many of the parliamentary yeah, records reference suicide? Records, yeah, yeah. So, so no, so I think, um, I think, so they were the absolute numbers for references to suicide. Um, but no, I don't think Northern Ireland, I think they were about third. I think it goes like the okay, UK, okay. Scotland, Northern yeah. Ireland, Wales. I think that's the order in. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they were specifically references to suicide, not to LGBT plus suicide. Okay, okay. Th thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just trying to remember, I think, Anya, that you had noted that there was a question in relation, I'm just looking back through some of the questions that came up earlier on in relation to um, uh, sexuality and uh, that was the one that was what came up 
that, that we, we said we'd hold over to ask Hazel. I don't know where, I'm just looking to see if I can see it now. Um, but at the moment, it was, it was quite broad, just, I suppose, on the link between or if there's a link between um, LGBTQ community and so that's, that was the question. So I think Hazel's entire talk kind of answered. answered OK, OK, OK. I, I couldn't remember the, the, the specifics of the question. Uh, I just check back into the, the Q&A. Um, so I just there's a the question here whether any of the your participants mentioned experiencing difficulty articulating uh, to healthcare professionals and if so did this hold them back from seeking help? Yeah, so I think there was there was quite a lot of kind of angst around particular. So I think one of the one of the challenges is if parents were were present within that environment and um, as being able to articulate their suicidal distress if their parent was next to them and they've kind of got concerns about being a burden and worrying their parents um, but actually wanting to seek help and so that kind of conflict between seeking help but also not wanting to worry anybody was something that was quite present um, but I also think there was a, a kind of another issue which is that sometimes young people didn't want to express suicidal distress kind of in their first meeting so it take a lot for them to go to the GP and they'd, they'd kind of start maybe talking about feeling low or feeling depressed um, and if that was closed down quite quickly um, some young people have been given kind of leaflets and, and told to kind of you know read a leaflet about it um, and so they never got to the point at which they were experiencing and expressing their suicidal distress because it had kind of already been shut down if that makes sense so they were trying to like tentatively lead into it um, but because that was taken as being the only issue and there wasn't space to expand and, and obviously we, we know how kind of under-resourced GPs are so we can it's a very understandable problem but without that space they weren't able to really go into their suicidal distress okay. and self-harm. Yeah, th thanks, Hazel. You can see that you need to kind of build up. You know, y y it's not something you can go in and talk about straight off, is it? No. Yeah, of course. It's and it's a really hard topic to talk about. So it takes a lot to kind of get there. And then if you're you're kind of sent away with leaflets at the first yeah. kind of hurdle, it can be it can feel really dismissive. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so another question here is the trans. Uh, the, so this uh, uh, this um, person is saying the trans community is still stigmatized within the LGBT community itself. Absolutely. Is yeah. this something that came up as a reason for suicidal ideation within with your trans participants? Um, I would say it wasn't it wasn't within the study and that is definitely not to say that that couldn't be an issue but I think within the participants in this study often they were quite um, embedded within kind of LGBT groups and, and didn't seem to be experiencing or at least didn't express um, to me um, difficulties kind of within that. Okay okay th th thanks Hazel and um, from one of our um, participants from Australia um, this person is saying as someone in Australia who works with the LGBT um, I plus homeless. Do you have any advice for minimizing self harm or suicidal ideation, as this is massively under researched, under researched and and under resourced here, uh, as in in Australia? I'm going to say um, that is a very big question, and I would like if that person wants to to give me a contact. Um, but I, off the top of my head, I'm not going to make a very good answer to that. So I'm going to be careful no, about answering. No, no, of course. And and I, I, again, noting that yours was a, a qualitative study with a very much so. enough, um, a sample of participants, but clearly it's it's an important, a very um, important issue. Yeah. yeah. And then I suppose a, um, an, another kind of issues specifically for specific groups is there's a there's a question about whether um any of your I think did you mention that some of your participants had had other had mentioned uh, health problems it's just this says what are your experiences of working with young people with disabilities in particular learning disabilities and those with autism spectrum was that yeah. something that came up in the work that you did yeah, absolutely. Um, and as I said, like it, it wasn't something that we specifically recruited for, for, but it was something that was very, very um, widespread throughout throughout our sample. Um, and so I think in terms of um, that kind of ableism that those young people faced, that was definitely a compounding factor, particularly I would say around bullying. Um, and for some of those young people, they were both experiencing queerphobic bullying, but also ableist bullying, and that could be really, really difficult. Um, 
I think in terms of, I, I, I'm not sure kind of what, I'm trying to cover all my bases here, um, but in terms of working with those young people myself, um, I think one of the things that the young people really commented upon within this is we used quite a lot of like paper-based resources during the research interviews. Um, and that was commented upon by young people as being really helpful because they talked about not having to make eye contact with me so if they felt uncomfortable about making eye contact that wasn't you know a big deal because they had stuff that they could draw on they could move around the table it was quite a tactile experience they had like um cards that they moved around if they wanted to they could write things on them um and so that was was something that proactively like we didn't ask about it but proactively some of the participants mentioned that that had been really helpful for them so mm -hmm. And, and did any, because um, a, a sort of related question came up and asked whether any, any young people with autism or ADHD found that their experiences were minimised or the link to their gender identity dismissed, you know, what... So, so actually, in terms of um, the conversations, particularly around, for example, um, accessing gender affirming medical treatment, I think many of the young people had had real difficulties within that so that wasn't something that was particularly spoken about by young people with ADHD or autism but actually it was quite a common experience amongst the trans young people within this study that was something that was really widely spoken about the kind of you know spending years on waiting lists getting moved between different services particularly the the child and adolescent service and into the adult service and how that could really mess up waiting yeah. times and things like that so it, it wasn't commented upon in terms of um particularly young people with ADHD and autism but it was widely commented upon by by young people trying to access gender affirming mental, medical treatment okay okay so it, being young was the biggest issue was it was that it was, it was that they were it was, it was lack of I think it's probably the kind of the lack of services um, and okay. the fact that young people were by virtue like young um, and often that that wasn't necessarily just coming from kind of clinical stuff it was often also coming from families people saying you know well how many of your friends are doing this at the moment and that sort of thing really dismissive attitudes yeah. um, for, for kind of all young people that were trying to access gender affirming medical treatment. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll make this the last question because I'm no, it's great. bombarding you with the questions. As no, they, it's, they, honestly, it's brilliant. Uh, so this is a, a rather specific question from, from uh, which said, I've recently opened a gender and sexuality alliance for young people as part of my youth work. I'm hoping to provide a space for young people to open up peer-to-peer -peer support, re-LGBT plus. Um, would you suggest having a conversation around suicide um, and in young people as part of one of the sessions or would that be something that should be avoided? That is really difficult to say, but I am actually in my spare half hour a youth worker. So if that person would like to get in touch with me, we could maybe have a chat about that kind of session planning and things like that. And we could have a conversation um, yeah. because, yeah, I've been a youth worker for many years on a voluntary basis. And, and so I'd be really happy to talk to them about that in more detail. That's great. Th thank, thanks, Hazel. And thank you to, to everybody um, uh, for, for your questions. Um, so we're we're rapidly running out of uh, time here, and uh, so I think I would uh, just like to um, end up this uh, our our session today by saying a huge thank you to all of our uh, many contributors, to uh, Maria for um, fantastic contribution, and particularly Maria, thank you so much for sharing all of those resources. It's really really helpful to have access to those, and as I say, my um, colleagues and the participants in Ireland, I'm sure will really welcome having access to that information. To um, Galit and Keith, thank you so much for that uh, insight into your uh, recent publications and also for sharing with us those uh, publications. I think, and I just know from uh, working with colleagues in Pieta that there have been a, lots of people have been concerned about the self-harm and suicidal ideation among younger children. I don't know whether that's um, in part uh, post uh, lockdown, um, but anyway, there's been a, a, lot of, a lot of concern among therapists about how to help these young people because they felt the information wasn't there. And I think Galit and Keith, the work that you're doing has just been hugely helpful in providing an evidence base. Um, and I, I found some of the data on uh, gender that you presented, Galit, was really fascinating to see that change in, in um, rates of um, uh, self-harm among different people. And then, uh, Hazel, thank you again so much for that really fascinating talk. So much there to open up 
other questions about the experiences uh, of young people um, who are LGBT. Uh, QI plus um, and, and some insight into the experiences that they have. And I mean, I think it's going to be so important for us to learn how to have helpful, supportive conversations with these people um, about their mental health um, so, so that they can feel supported um, in their conversations with, with, with therapists. And just to say, I, if any of you want to open up the chat there, you'll see that we've got a hugely appreciative audience who are um, expressing their thanks and delight with all the presentations this morning. So thanks, and I, sorry, can I just particularly also say thanks to Anya who has so ably managed all the organization in relation to this. Um, managing Eventbrite, managing um, everybody's questions. There were lots of questions before this started and all with calmness and all with um, gentle reminders to me when I was being infuriatingly um, not present at some of the time. So thank you very much, Anya. This, this uh, webinar really couldn't have happened without you. So um, thanks to everybody. And um, I hope that... Um, you found today useful, I'm sure you have, and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you again at other events uh, that we organize. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you.